Welcome back uh, to the second session uh, today of the Saturday University. Um, I'd like to begin again by, by uh, expressing thanks again to our sponsors, the University of Wyoming and the UW Foundation, the Wyoming Humanities Council and the Teton County Library and the Teton County Library Foundation. Of course, the National Museum of Wildlife Art. And I'd also like to give special mention to Central Wyoming College, which is working with us uh, to offer credit uh, for part of today's events, if you are uh, interested in obtaining some university level credit. Um, and special thanks, of course, to our sponsors, the Angler Inn, who put up uh, the faculty last night, and to the Platte Creek Ranch, who have helped to uh, look after them and feed them. So thank you very much to our sponsors. Our next speaker is Professor Phil Holt, who since 1967 has been the pillar of classical education here at the University of Wyoming. He teaches Latin and a variety of courses in Greek literature and culture. He's now a professor of classics and he chairs the Department of Modern and Classical Languages. Along the way, Along the way, Dr. Holt has won the L. Wogan Award for Excellence in Classroom Teaching from the university, and on a national level, he has won the College Teaching Award from the American Philological Association, which is the National uh, Association for Classicists. Um, Dr. Holt publishes regularly in leading classical journals. His present research focuses on the Greek tragedy from which his talk today on the Greek hero cult uh, derives. He's written on Virgil, the lost epics of the Trojan War and the putative sex lives of Greek tyrants. <laughs> since, since 2000, uh, Dr. Holt has been the moving force uh, behind the Wyoming Summer Classics Institute, which is organized under the auspices of the Wyoming Humanities Council. Uh, that event brings every summer uh, together teachers and other curious adults with international experts for five fun-filled days of great books, sex, violence, politics, war, and all those other things that make life worth living. Uh, I know from experience that he will plug the Institute shamelessly if you give him half a chance, and I've probably unfortunately just done that. So, Dr. Uh, Phil Holt on Greek heroes, good guys, bad guys, or both. <laughs> Uh, thank you, and sound all right? Yes, yes? all right. Thank you. Um, thank you, Paul, for the kind words and for giving me a chance to plug the Summer Classics Institute shamelessly. <laughs> um, we're going into our 11th year now, and uh, there was some of the impetus uh, from this uh, actually uh, came from Jackson Hole. Uh, Walt Tulin was uh, very active on it. So yes, every uh, year we bring together some uh, fine faculty and really interested adults to focus on some aspect of the ancient world. Our uh, topic uh, for, and we get, lecture, we get lectures and short courses on um, various aspects of the period, politics, history, art, uh, literature, archeology, span and uh, we also have a, a central reading, a book discussion uh, for seminar. And uh, this year our theme is Making Rome Great, How Roman Culture and Power Grew. Uh, there's some copies of this flyer out on uh, the table outside, bright red. Uh, we're going to focus this time on, um, oh, about the Roman Republic, about third and second centuries BC. Main seminar reading will be uh, Titus Livy on the Second Punic War. And we have other people in coming in to do Plautus comedies and uh, Roman religion and uh, some other things like that. So um, it's an interesting period in Roman history. Uh, Livy has some, uh, gives some really neat accounts of it. Uh, you get, uh, so you get all of that. You also get, with the Second Punic War, we get Hannibal's and Hannibal and elephants. If you like this sort of thing, you will uh, love that. So you can check it out, uh, please, on uh, the Wyoming Humanities Council website. All right, the other main thing I'm here for today, let's see, I'm here to talk about uh, Greek heroes, what sort of people Greeks honor with hero cult. And first then a few words about what a hero is, as Greeks use the term, and what a hero cult is. Well, simply enough, in Greek religious terms, a hero is a human being who has died, 
but it continues to exercise power from beyond the grave, unlike most of us, and therefore it needs, should be honored and worshipped and appeased on a larger scale than the usual honors paid to ordinary dead. Um, hero is fundamentally a religious term. Um, Greeks use the word broadly, but far less loosely than we do, and it is a Greek word, so I'm going to uh, be focusing on uh, that. Cult, by cult I simply mean regular rituals uh, to done to honor and worship, and in uh, Greek hero cult that typically means uh, once a year you get a bunch of people together and sacrifice a sheep at the hero's grave, and um, then uh, maybe have a uh, nice banquet out of it. Uh, sometimes you can have cults that involve whole cities, much larger uh, communities. Uh, so let's see, uh, start, and this is an outgrowth, hero cult is an outgrowth of what we call attendance or um, uh, cult of ordinary dead. Um, and this is the kind of thing we do when we put flowers on people's graves, you know, we want to honor the dead people and respect them and show we're keeping their, um, uh, their memory alive. And uh, Greek counterparts of this humane custom are more elaborate. Feasts on the third, the ninth, and thirtieth days after funeral. Visits after that to the grave to leave food or small bottles of olive oil or tie bands of wool around the tombstone. Keeping these things up, the customary rites for one's parents and close relatives was important. Sometimes childless Greeks adopted oh, uh, oh, children, adopted other people, specifically so they would have someone around to carry them on. And eventually, after a couple of generations, the dead slip out of memory, observances taper off. But while they last, they keep up some emotional contact between the living and the departed. Well, heroes likewise receive honors. Typically, the worship of a hero is centered on his grave or tomb, and the hero is more, far more often than not a he, and the offerings may include food or trinkets. The vocabulary for offerings to heroes and those to ordinary dead overlap. For that matter, the word hero is sometimes used, mostly in later times, for an ordinary dead person. It appears on tombstones. For Aristocles, the hero. For Irene, heroine. For Agathos, hero. For Damon, hero. Grave inscriptions sometimes end with the words, good hero, farewell. The hero so-and-so became a way of saying the late so-and-so. The difference between hero cult and cult attendance of ordinary dead is really more a matter of uh, scale than of difference in kind. All dead are honored by their immediate families, perhaps up to about the third generation. Heroes are honored by larger communities such as clans or cities. Their honors may include sacrifices and feasts, festivals, games beyond what ordinary dead receive. Their cults often come with more institutional apparatus, sanctuaries, priests, associations with altars and treasuries uh, and, uh, and festivals. And their worship continues over a longer period of time, often for centuries. So what sort of people are singled out for this special treatment? The word hero for us is regularly positive. We use the word for people who win battles or football games or champion noble causes or do great deeds. Greeks sometimes do the same. Greeks did worship with cult, war heroes, athletic heroes, civic benefactors, and protagonists of quest myths. In fact, their views of honorable heroes is far broader than ours. Men of the heroic age, that is the time of the Trojan War and the other great myths, which as far as Greeks were concerned in historical times was way the heck back before anyone could remember, uh, some of them were spoken of as heroes. Poets and sages were honored with hero cult. We hear of cults to Homer, Sappho, Pindar, Aeschylus. Pythagoras was honored as a hero. Some of the great philosophical schools honored their founders as heroes. Uh, the philosopher Epicurus made provisions in his will for an annual feast in his honor, and that I think really is a form of hero cult. And that's kind, of, um, that's kind of ironic because Epicureans basically did not believe in life after death. <laughs> but Epicurus uh, arranged for it anyway. <laughs> Heroic honors were paid to people who benefited their communities one way or another. So we hear of a cult for Futilus, the first man to cultivate fig trees. Pixodorus, who discovered a reign of especially fine marble near Ephesus just in time for construction of the great temple of Artemis there. Kiwamites, whose name means bean man at Athens. 
Uh, I think he's got to be a very shadowy figure. There was probably an old tomb or grave with uh, the name Kuamites associated with it. So why would people worship anybody named Bean Man? We've got three answers to that, which means probably none of them is really very good. Uh, but, um, oh, uh, no, let's see. He may have been the first to discover that beans could be cultivated. Or perhaps the magistrates assigned offices by drawing lots near his sanctuary. You can draw lots by pulling different colored beans out of a pot. Uh, or, perhaps the or perhaps bean sellers hawk their produce nearby. Recent benefactors as well as mythic ones could be honored with cult. One subspecies of heroes is civic benefactors, people who give lots of money to worthy causes. And I know many of you, in fact, are very active in... Uh, community causes, you might take this down as an idea for fundraising. <laughs> Our examples are mostly from Roman times, when cities had come to rely heavily on private philanthropy to balance their budgets. The details are mostly in inscriptions recording resolutions by town assemblies, private cult associations, and the like. The Dionysiasts of the Piraeus, a private religious association with their own honors to Dionysus, commemorated one of their leaders, aptly named Dionysius, after his death. He had served the association as both priest and treasurer, made a contribution to 1,000 drachmas towards providing a meeting place, donated another 500 drachmas for a statue of the god Dionysus. This runs into probably uh, mid-upper uh, five figures, uh, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. So therefore, the inscription includes, it is resolved that the Orgeonis, the members of the association, see to it that Dionysius be made into a hero and be set up in the temple next to the god. That means a statue of him, the big money giver, right next to a statue of the god Dionysus. Uh, that he be set up in the temple next to the god, where his father also is, in order that there might be a fine monument to him for all time. The town of Delphi voted more elaborate honors for Nicandros, a civic benefactor recently deceased. Quote, it has been resolved by the city that heroic honors be voted to him, that the priest is to pray to him in the council house, that his honors are to be announced in the greatly distinguished cities in which the holy games are held, namely Delphi, Olympia, Argos, and Corinth. Xenon was honored with the sanctuary, the Xenoneon, and the cult association at Theopera. At Anaphae, quote, the people heroized Ioannassa, the wife of Crinoteles, for her virtue and nobility, because of her seemly life, her outstanding love of her country, husband and children, and her benefactions to the people. I suspect that's in ascending order of importance. <laughs> the writer Pausanias put it more succinctly in explaining why Ithidas was accorded the honors given to a hero by, uh, by the Messenians. Quote, he had become a man of some power because of his money. Uh, another way, if you had money and wanted to be a hero, you could actually skip the um, civic benefactions and make yourself one. That is, you could endow a foundation in your memory. We have a number of these do-it-yourself hero cults. <laughs> we have a few cases from Hellenistic times with inscriptions for the provisions, recording the provisions for memorial endowments. So if you want to be a hero, you can provide some capital, either land to be leased out or cash to be lent out at interest, to finance an annual banquet or festival in honor of yourself and your family. These operations go well beyond the usual honors which a family renders to its recent mem ancestors. They involve cult associations with lots of members and regular officers, and the arrangements show they are clearly meant to endure. The scale of the feasting extends well beyond the immediate family, in one case, it involved the whole town of Aigiele with portions of meat for all the citizens and visiting Romans besides. The terminology used for these things is regularly that of hero cult. The honored dead are referred to as heroes. They are buried in a tomb called a heroon or a hero sanctuary, sometimes with a garden and banquet hall adjoining. So, you don't need to do great deeds or found a city to become a hero. You can pay for it yourself. Despite all the great deeds and benefactions done by heroes, they have their sinister side. Fabrius, a late writer of epigrams, has a hero say to a devotee, a person who's praying to him, not one of the heroes, my friend, can provide good. 
for that pray to the gods. We are the givers of all bad things that are found among men. If you want bad things, then pray. I will give you many, even if you ask for just one. Babrius' division of labor, here are gods do good things, heroes do bad things, is too simple for the varied phenomena of actual cult. Heroes provide a lot of the same good things the gods have to offer. They do healing, they give oracles, they offer help and protection in war. Uh, for that matter, heroes could provide small services as well as great ones. We hear of heroes under names such as Deipnos and Dites, and those mean feaster and banqueter. They were party gods. Um, Heracles, whose labors made the world safe for civilization, also had sidelines in fighting agricultural pests. We find cults of Heracles the Locust Man at Eta and Heracles the Worm Killer at Mimas. <laughs> a festival at Lephora in Arcadia included a preliminary sacrifice to the hero Muagros, that is, flycatcher, <laughs> because he could keep the flies off the meat destined for community sacrifice, community feast. On the other hand, heroes are sometimes invoked in curses. You can pray for heroes for bad things to happen to other people. Heroes could cause stroke and panic attacks. Meeting a hero at night was dangerous. It was best to pass by the tombs and sanctuaries of heroes in silence. It helps, by the way, if you bite your lip to make sure you keep quiet. <laughs> if heroes could cause trouble, trouble might be imputed to heroes. Here's a good example. At Olympia, home of the Olympic Games, there is a place near the racetrack where horses on their way to the chariot races shod. And this was inevitably produced to, uh, pr attributed to some kind of supernatural influence. For that matter, we do the same, at least in the figure of speech, when we say a horse is spook, right? Whether you believe in spooks or not, you talk that way. Um, so the being who caused these disturbances was given a name, Taraxippos, the disturber of horses, or the horse spooker. And if he had a name, did he also have a story that would tell us who he was and why he took to spooking horses? There are various theories, but the most highly developed one had a first-rate connection with both horses and Olympia. Troxippus was said to be Myrtilus, the charioteer to King Enomaus, whose murder led to the founding of the Olympic Games. And there's a really juicy, sordid story behind that one, but um, oh, uh, I'll, just give you, I'll just say there's this close connection. Heroes can cause all sorts of trouble, often in defense of their honor and prerogatives. In 492 or 491 BC, the king of Persia sent heralds to various Greek cities to demand that they give him earth and water as the token of submission. This was the run-up to the Battle of Marathon. Some cities complied, some refused. The Spartans, in a fit of patriotic fervor, not only refused, they murdered the heralds. This brought down upon them the wrath of Talthybius. Now, Talthybius is a character in the Iliad. He was the herald of the Greek army. So these were people in his profession. Spartan heralds claimed descent from Talthybius. So uh, Talthybius uh, intervened on behalf of heralds. And um, let's see. He sent a series of bad omens upon the Spartans. The Spartans were eventually driven to send two of their own citizens, two brave volunteers, to Persia be killed as recompense for the murder of the two Persians. Uh, the king of the Persians uh, refused, and there are two versions of that. The high-minded one is that he was so impressed by the courage of these two men who would die for their country that he spared them. The other one is he figured, if I kill them, that will appease Talthybius. I do not want to let the Spartans off the hook. Anagiros was a minor hero in Athens, but he was dangerous when aroused. A man had the temerity to cut wood in Anagiros' sacred grove. There are enough stories about cutting wood in a sacred grove that you really ought to know not to do that. <laughs> in this case, yes, and the hero took deadly revenge. He made the man's mistress fall in love with his son. The son piously rejected her advances. You'll recognize this from Joseph and Potiphar's wife in Genesis. It's that story pattern. The son piously rejected her advances. She accused him of raping her. In the bloody denouement, the father mutilated the son and had him walled up in the house, and the father and his mistress both committed suicide. Another case in point was Oibotas, an athlete from the region of Achaea, who won a victory in the Olympian Games. 
He was not honored for this achievement as he felt that he deserved, so he cursed the Achaeans. And if you know the history of the Boston Red Sox, you can probably see where this is headed. <laughs> no one from Achaea won at the Olympics for a long time until finally, about three centuries later, the Achaeans consulted an oracle and asked what to do about it. They were told to honor Oibotas, they erected a statue of him, and they probably instituted a hero cult as well. After that, Achaeans began winning again. Actually, there are a few Achaeans who won prizes in the intervening years, but I'm not going to spoil a good story by bringing that up. <laughs> Sometimes heroic grudges are reflected in cult. Take the case of Eunostos of Tanagra. His cousin conceived a lust for him and propositioned him, but he virtuously refused her advances. Spurned, she toward her, told her brothers that Eunostos had raped her. If this works in one story, it'll work in some others. <laughs> they killed him. She later repented, recanted, and committed suicide. Her brothers were exiled, and Eunostos was honored with a hero cult, sort of to make things up for him, up to him. No woman was allowed to enter the consecrated area, and the townspeople kept careful watch to make sure that this taboo was observed. Once, a woman got into the sanctuary, and a prominent citizen of the town testified that he saw Eunostos going to the sea to wash himself. So even in death, he thought girls were icky. Uh, women were kept out of some of Orpheus' sanctuaries, the famous poet and singer, and uh, he was, in myth, torn apart by women, so you keep women out of his sanctuaries. They were kept out of a lot of sanctuaries belonging to Heracles, which, considering Heracles' dealings with women, was probably just as well. No herald was allowed to enter the sanctuary of Ocridion on Rhodes, and no piper was allowed in the sanctuary of Tenes on Tenedos. Now, both of these men came to nasty, ugly inns, and a herald played a large part in one story, and a piper played a large part in the other. So, the cult regulations respected the hero's sensibilities. On a more positive note, only women were allowed to enter the sanctuary of Heracles at Erythrae, or the only women allowed to enter the sanctuary, sorry, were Thracians, because Thracian women had played a key part in bringing Heracles' cult statue to the city. We begin to see a pattern here. Heroes are apt to have a keen sense of honor. They are quick to resent slights. They can take it out on the people who have wronged them. They nurse terrible, everlasting grudges, and they do terrible things until they are propitiated. One theme worth tracking in this is the relationship and the contrast between strong individual and community. Uh, you get community over here. Heroes stand out from the community. They are apart from, they are essential to communities a lot of the time. They often are, um, they often stand against the community. Sometimes they are mistreated by it, yet in the end they receive cult from it. Communities need strong individuals, yet these individuals often expose their weaknesses. Cult is, among other things, a way of establishing a symbiosis between two different and conflicting parties. Heroes, or a lot of them then, suffer greatly. Sometimes the hero's suffering is redemptive and it leads to a good end. There are hero cults for people who gave themselves as sacrificial victims to save their countries in time of peril. The Athenians had a myth that once the city was stricken with a plague, and they were told that they would find relief only by performing a human sacrifice. Oh, this is myth, by the way, not history. Uh, nobody actually admits to doing human sacrifice in Greece, but way back then they did it. So they needed to form human sacrifice. Laos offered his daughters as victims, and the plague ceased. Their tomb became a sanctuary, the Laocorion. It was a prominent landmark in Athens. In the days of King Erechtheus, again, this is back in myth time, the Athenians were under attack, and an oracle was given to them saying they would win the war only if they performed a human sacrifice. The daughters of Erechtheus, or one of them, bravely volunteered. Athens won the war. The daughters were honored with a hero cult. Euripides tr treated the story in a play now lost, and he used the motif, uh, young victim offering self for human sacrifice to win war in plays like the Heracleidae and Iphigenia at Aulis. Euripides really loved dead virgins. <laughs> More often, however, the hero simply dies defeated, often after being terribly wronged. 
There's a more complicated story behind the cult of Eurypolis, who was worshipped as a hero in the sanctuary of Artemis Lafraya at Patrai in Achaea. Uh, if you're taking notes, never mind all of that. He did have a real hero cult. In the old days, a young priestess of Artemis in nearby ROA fell in love, but her father refused to let her and her beloved marry. Thus thwarted, they gratified their desire in Artemis, Artemis sanctuary. This was wrong. The girl was obligated to remain a virgin during the time of her priesthood, which was not forever, but uh, she had to stay virgin while she was priestess. And you don't have sex in sanctuaries, and you especially don't do it in the sanctuary of a virgin goddess. <laughs> Artemis' wrath was swift. Crops failed. People began dying from strange diseases. The townspeople consulted an oracle, which is you may be gathered is what people in stories like this do in situations like that. And the oracle revealed that how Artemis sanctuary had been desecrated. To expiate this offense, they had to sacrifice the best looking girl and the best looking boy in the city every year until they were visited by a foreign king coming to their land, bringing a foreign god. Cut to Troy when it fell to the Greeks. Eurypolis, one of the victorious Greeks, got a mysterious chest as part of his booty. He opened it and found inside an image of the god Dionysus. Upon seeing it, he went mad. During one of his lucid intervals, he consulted an oracle, which told him that wherever he met people performing an alien sacrifice, there he should put down the chest and settle. He wandered, carrying the fateful chest with him. One day, he landed at ROA, precisely on the day when the boy and the girl were to be sacrificed. So two oracles were fulfilled. He was the foreign king with the foreign god, and theirs was the alien sacrifice. Eurypolis was healed, and the sacrifices were brought to an end. Uh, I think that we get this in a very straightforward, plain prose narration from Pausanias, but I think it's, uh, it's uh, really a, uh, oh, uh, a moving story. We have transgressions born out of ordinary human weakness by the lovers and by Eurypolis. These bring down implacable wrath. Salvation can only be won on the cryptic terms laid down by a mysterious oracle. One cult ends and another, that of the hero, is born. The suffering wanderer and the suffering community, through a divine providence that is completely arbitrary, heal each other. Eurypolis is closer to Oedipus at Colonus, you know, Sophocles' masterpiece about what happened to Oedipus after he discovered his terrible secret. He wandered as a blind beggar and then came to Athens, and after all his toils, the gods granted him the special favor that he could uh, bring extra blessings upon the uh, community where he died and was buried, which, by the way, means Oedipus at Colonus is also partly about the foundation of a hero cult. So uh, I, think, uh, I think Eurypolis is a close cousin of, uh, of Oedipus. If some heroes receive cult because of slights to their honor, others get it because of terrible wrongs. Readers of Euripides know of Medea as the woman who killed her children. Jason dubbed her for somebody else. She killed the intended bride and her father and, just to wrap it off, the uh, children she'd had by Jason so she would cut him off without issue. Uh, in Corinth, though, where the legend is set, the story, the local version had it that Medea killed the bride and her father, but not the children. She left them behind. She plucked them in a sanctuary of Hera so they would be safe, and then skipped town. She did not, uh, she neither killed them nor took them with, him, with her. Well, the Corinthians were enraged, and they took out their anger on the innocent children and killed them in a sanctuary yet. <laughs> the community was stricken by a plague. The people consulted an oracle, and they were told to propitiate Medea's children. So they gave them a proper burial and instituted a hero cult for them. Uh, by the way, there's a good chance that the thing that most of us remember Medea about, she killed her own children, there's a good chance that was Euripides' own invention. He put that into play just to make it nastier. And this is the way we remember it, right? It's a much neater story that way. But that wasn't the original version. The children had a hero cult. Carilla, an orphan and a beggar, and one of the few female, hero, female heroes that were heroines I'm going to mention in this, came to Delphi and asked the king for food. The king haughtily refused, even taking off his sandal and striking the poor girl with it. 
she hanged herself out of mortification and despair. There was famine. Notice the connection here, by the way. The king refused to give the beggar food, so the community is punished by not being able to get any food of its own. There was famine. The people consulted an oracle which told them to propitiate Carilla. The people complied, and they instituted a festival in her honor. Children in the town of Kafuai, playing around the temple of Artemis, found a piece of rope. They tied it around the neck of Artemis' statue and joked that they had hanged her. The townspeople were outraged and stoned the children. After that, all the pregnant women in the town had miscarriages. Notice here, by the way, that uh, as in Dante and uh, as in Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado, the punishment fits the crime. <laughs> that is, the, um, oh, uh, Artem well, Artemis, part of Artemis' province is aiding women in labor, and uh, also the uh, people who stoned their own children couldn't have any more children of their own. So the townspeople consulted an oracle and were told to give them a funeral and make offerings to them every year, for they had died unjustly. So here's one answer to my title question about how to become a Greek hero. This is the hero route you can take if you don't want to give lots of money to anything. First, die a horrible, degrading death. <laughs> then, just wait. <laughs> if you're really hero material, bad things will happen in the community that will kill you. Plague, crop failure, famine, defeat, war, and more bad omens or some combination of them. The people will then consult an oracle which will tell them they're being punished for the shabby way they treated you, and things will get better if they start a cult in your honor and sacrifice a sheep at your grave once a year. In these stories, hero cult is a way of writing past wrongs and squaring accounts with the dead. The hero dies with unfinished business. Uh, they do not achieve balance. They do not achieve closure. What does cult do with all of these other things? Well, story and ritual restore the balance and complete something that was missing in life. It is a form of compensation, or perhaps therapy for the dead. We pass from heroes who do bad things to heroes who are bad people. And the victims in this story are not innocent. Here's an example from Timessa. This is one of my favorite hero stories. It's a Greek settlement in southern Italy. During the course of their long wanderings, Odysseus and his men put in at Timessa. One of the crew raped a local girl, and for that he was stoned by the outraged townspeople. His ghost, however, haunted the area and went around killing people. The townspeople consulted an oracle about how to stop this chain of murders, and they were told to offer the slain man a virgin every year. The hapless girl was to be led out of the man's tomb at night, and he would spear it away for her away for a fate worse than death, and death too. The name of the rapist is variously reported. Our fullest account of him refers to him simply as the hero. And despite his crime, the story follows the pattern of the victim hero. This one, by the way, has a happy ending because one year when they were about to lead the um, oh, uh, virgin of the year to her doom, just in the nick of time, along came Euthymus of Locri. He was a real person. He was a three-time boxing champion. I suspect his the story got elaborated, but he was a real person. He was three-time boxing champion at uh, the Olympics, the last time in 480 BCE. And so he fell in love with the victim, destined for the hero's looks, took on the hero in combat, defeated him, and drove him into the sea. Here's another case, more or less historic. Cleomedes was a champion boxer from the small island of Astypalaia. In the Olympics of 496 BCE, he killed his opponent in the ring, and officials refused to recognize him as the winner. Here's what happened next. He went mad and returned to Astypalaia, where he attacked a school with almost 60 students and pulled down the column that held up the roof. After the roof fell on the children, he was pelted with stones by the citizens and took refuge in the temple of Athena. When he climbed into a chest that was placed in the temple and pulled the lid shut, the Astypalaians faced hard work to no effect as they tried to open the chest. At last, they stove in the boards of the chest and found no Cleomedes in it, either alive or dead. They sent men to Delphi to ask what had become of Cleomedes. This was the oracle's reply. The latest of the heroes is Cleomedes, the Astypalaian. Honor him with sacrifices as being no longer mortal. So, we get these two stories. Uh, this would be sort of the equivalent of having a hero cult for... Uh, 
Ted Bundy, the serial rapist, and the victims of Columbine. Uh, this is a very different culture from ours. And uh, it's, uh, those are both uh, uh, prime exhibits in my case about how some really awful, terrible people who do really awful, terrible things become heroes. But why did they do this? Well, I don't think I can give you a complete answer, but let me identify some factors. Heroes are fundamentally powerful beings, and they can be powerful for good or ill. As we've seen, they were often regarded as dangerous characters, likely to harm as well as help, meant to be appeased as well as honored. This is the most important single difference between what Greeks meant by hero and what we mean by it. Greek heroes are usually great. They are not necessarily good. There's more. The people who exercise a hero's power after death are often the sort of people who had exceptional power for good or ill in life. Extraordinary people whom it does not seem fitting to treat as ordinary dead. Heroes represent power that is not extinguished with death and it can work from beyond the grave. Heroes are great in ways that are sinister and uncanny. Hero cult expresses respect, but it also expresses awe, dread, and fear. Terrible people become heroes, victims of terrible suffering and wrong, dangerous enemies, outlaws who transgress the norms. Hero tales and the tales associated with them express some of the ambivalence that we feel about power. In some ways, the closest counterpart to our own in our own folklore to Greek heroes is ghosts. The hero of Temesa, after all, had, uh, was a vengeful ghost. Heroes and ghosts are both powerful dead, dead who do not go away quietly after, uh, after the funerals. They are often people who suffered greatly in life and died suddenly and unprepared. Murder victims make good ghosts. You know, these are people whose lives were cut off abruptly and wrongly and they continue haunting the house where it happened or uh, the place of the town that, um, where the deed took place or something like that. So heroes and ghosts both leave life with a lot of unfinished business and they take out their resentments and grudges on the living. The sort of power that clung around heroes' tombs and remains should make sense to connoisseurs of ghost lore. Heroes' tombs were haunted areas. One did well to pass them by in silence. And remember, bite your lip, because that'll help. The battlefield at Marathon was haunted. People passing by at night could hear weapons clashing and horses neighing as the ghosts of Greeks and Persians kept up their combat. And by the way, these ghost sightings kept up for over six centuries after the, after the battle. The plain of Troy was likewise haunted. Ghost warriors were seen at night. The Greek hero Ajax sometimes appeared once to frighten away some locals who were insulting his grave mound, another to avenge a different insult. The insult here was that a bunch of shepherds were keeping watch over their flocks by night out on the plain near Ajax's grave mound, which was a, a, a prominent landmark at Troy. And they were doing something I guess Greeks like to do in a lot of situations. They were quoting bits of Homer at each other. And <laughs> one of them got to the line not even Ajax stood fast, and then Ajax appeared and said, I did too stand fast, <laughs> and vanished. If we look at heroes as powerful dead rather than good ones, whoops, sorry about that little equipment repair, repair, repair. Am I audible again? Thank you. So heroes are powerful dead, they're not necessarily good ones, and a lot of the tales behind Greek hero cults make more sense. Heroes are bad people, or transgressors, outlaws, and renegades. Here are a few more examples, none of them as nasty as Cleomedes or the uh, hero of Temesa, but uh, let's see if you get, uh, here's one I really like. Drimachos was worshipped as a hero on the island of Chios. He was an outlaw and a brigand, part Robin Hood, part godfather, and quite possibly an historical person. The Chians, we are told, were the first Greeks to import slaves, but the terrain of their island, rocky and heavily wooded, provided a good refuge for slaves who ran away. Drimachos emerged as the leader of a band of these runaways. He was resourceful and brave, and the Chians were unable to subdue him or his men or keep them from raiding their farms. Eventually, the two sides worked out a compromise, or as Drimachus called it, a treaty. He and his men would be free to operate as brigands, robbing and looting, but they set limits on what they would take. 
In effect, by the way, this turns his operation from a uh, disorderly, messy outlaw gang to a protection racket. <laughs> he even established weights and measures to make sure that everyone knew how much he was taking, and he took to issuing receipts. <laughs> In case his boys paid a second call on a farmer, he could pull it out and say, see, I've already paid. He also promised to return to their masters any more runaway slaves who joined him unless he determined that their masters had mistreated them seriously. And this creates an interesting relationship of the, uh, between the runaway slaves and uh, the Kean establishment. Uh, Germicus is not against the institution of slavery. He's been a slave himself. His men are ex-slaves, but uh, he's not against the institution of slavery. He's not a Marxist or anything like that. He only wants a piece of the establishment's action. So they lived, the, his gang and the Keans lived in this symbiotic relationship until he died. After his death, the number of runaway slaves increased, and Drimachus was honored as a hero by both slaves and masters. And again, here we get disorder. You restore order by giving someone, honoring someone with cult. Quote, when the Keans, again wronged and plundered by their slaves, remembered how reasonable the dead man had been, they established a hero sanctuary in the land, and named it the Shrine of the Kindly Hero. Even today, escaped slaves bring him the first fruits of whatever they steal. They say that he appears in dreams to many of the Keans and tells them in advance about slave plots, and those to whom he appears go to the place where his heroine is and sacrifice to him. So again, he's mediating a um, uneasy but uh, reasonably balanced relationship between uh, the uh, masters and the runaway slaves. Another ambivalent figure was the agonies of Thassos, a champion runner, boxer, and practitioner of a brutal all-in fighting, all fighting event called the Pankration. The Pankration was really, really ugly. Uh, two guys would get in the ring and go at each other. Uh, the only things they couldn't do to each other were eye gouging and I think strangleholds. And it kept on until one of them, and remember these are both elite, proud, highly competitive athletes, only until one of them conceded. People died during this, and Theagades was very good at it. In fact, he won 1,400 victories in athletic competitions, some of them at the Olympics, and the Thassians honored him by setting up a statue of him in their marketplace after he died. And we have some other anecdotes about him. He was a really mean, uh, arrogant bastard. He was a real jerk, <laughs> and people like that make enemies. One of the Thassians, bitterly resentful, went down to the marketplace every night with a whip and lashed his statue. <laughs> One night, the statue fell over on him and killed him. <laughs> the man's dead relatives had no one else to prosecute for his death, so they brought charges against the statue. <laughs> it was tried, found guilty. Steve, I'd be interested in hearing your take on this one. <laughs> Steve's our lawyer here, one of them, or one of them. Um, so the statue was tried, found guilty, and thrown into the sea. <laughs> Shortly after that, crops began to fail and there was famine. <laughs> You'll never guess what happened next. <laughs> right? They consulted, they consulted an oracle, yes. <laughs> See, we're learning to think like Greeks. <laughs> so the Thassians consulted an oracle and told them to recall their exiles. They did, famine continued, and then they realized that Theagony's statue, which they had thrown to the bottom of the sea, was an exile too, and so they had to get it back. <laughs> Fortunately, uh, the statue, a fisherman's net became entangled with the statue. He hauled it up, they put it back on his pedestal. And they, Thassians, can't pronounce this, Thassians put it up right where it stood before and they regularly offer sacrifices as to a god. By the way, the statue, the base of that statue has been excavated. We know there was some sort of honor for him on Thassos. Uh, the statue is gone. It was probably bronze and got recycled, blown back. Now, I've told a lot of stories partly to make the point that heroes resist easy generalization. This is reasonable. Any being with powers and activities somewhere between gods and mortals might be labeled as a hero. So Greek heroes are a mixed lot. They're all larger than life, but they're all larger in different ways. Uh, they can be great in accomplishments, great in their suffering, greater in, great in power, malice, and danger. 
You don't want to be like these people. You don't want your kids to be, grow up to be like these people. They make lousy role models. By the way, you know, uh, behavior of people like Tiger Woods would make a lot more sense in Greek terms. <laughs> we have this expectation that star athletes be well behaved. Well, why should the two things go together? Um, Unlike our heroes, Greek heroes do not always overcome challenges and emerge triumphant. Death, after all, is a precondition for becoming a hero. And the hero's death may be the most important thing about his story. Many of them die harshly and unjustly. For some of them, cult is not so much an honor for achievements as partial recompense for suffering or failure or a way of averting their wrath. Despite what Joseph Campbell and the Jungians tell you Greek heroes are not models of the individuation process. They often fail to grow up and achieve integration or wholeness. They're more interesting figures and stories that way, by the way. <coughs> Rather, their transgressions and grudges extend even beyond the grave. Like the Flying Dutchman and like many ghosts, they keep on trying to work out their unfinished business. Oibotas keeps on taking out his resentments on Achaean athletes. Eunostos keeps on hating women. The hero of Temesa keeps on raping. Heroes do not put it all behind them and move on. They do not achieve closure. They will not be guests on Oprah. <laughs> uh, some of my students, by the way, have suggested uh, Jerry Springer is a more likely uh, venue for uh, Greek heroes and a lot of tragic <laughs> figures. <laughs> in fact, they keep on engaging in compulsive, repetitive behavior. Hero cult is partly an expression of and a response to the deficiencies, frustrations, and imbalances in the hero's lives. So, how do such people come to have cults in their honor? I could say that Greek hero cult, like other forms of cult in Greece, was a way of dealing with power. Greeks did not expect their gods to be good or benevolent. And so they were freed from the complications which you have to take on, say, if you're a Christian, and you have to deal with the problem of evil, you know. How does, a, how does a God who is all-powerful and all-loving and all-knowing allow undeserved suffering? If you believe there are a lot of gods out there, they keep working at cross-purposes, and some of them are out to get you, then life makes a lot more sense. <laughs> I could say all that, and it would be true as far as it went, but at least too much unexplained. I don't believe that hero cult is based simply on fear or that there's more to heroes, and I do believe that there's more to heroes than divine power. There's something else about these sinister figures that attracts as well as terrifies, and I think it is, has, has something to do with heroes being human, that is to say, despite appearances like us. They're not simply powerful beings. They're people whose aspirations, frustrations, sins, sufferings, and defeats reflect our own. Hero cults usually come with tales attached, and the tales bring in the whole range of human nature, particularly some of its darker aspects. We are now in myth territory, amid simple traditional stories with a lot of power to evoke some of the basic issues and the most important concerns of human life. Most of these stories are not big myths made famous through treatment of great works of literature. Most of the stories I've told probably involve people in places you never heard of. Some of the stories are kind of dumb. Uh, no matter, what is it that makes people tell such stories at all, and why do such stories become attached to particular cults and rituals? To begin with, how do we, or how might we, identify with heroes? We can admire the good ones, we can sympathize with the victims, but after that, things get a bit murkier. How are, are we to respond to Theagenes, the haughty athlete whose statue was mistreated, um, and who, after all, did get some kind of honor out of it. And what about vengeful spirits like Oibotas or the bearers of eternal grudges like Eunostos? Are we to feel pain and rage over their slighted honor and unjust suffering? Or are they simply proud and unreasonable? The answer, I think, is something of both. Oh, my title question, Greek heroes, good guys, bad guys, are both the answer is yes, all of the above. At this point, I want to introduce a distinction between our standards for conduct in real life and our standards for characters in stories. In real life, of course, we disprove of pride, immoderation, and breaking the rules of civilized behavior. But we like to fantasize about those things. 
they have a sinister allure because we really want to do them. Well, we wouldn't do them really, right? We're too moral and we could get caught. Uh, but um, we like stories about them, and the pleasure of such stories is far more complex than simply seeing wrongdoers caught and punished. The stories engage both the id and the superego. We root for both sides. Drimachus, the runaway slave and brigand of Chios, straddles both realms nicely. He is an arch criminal, uh, someone who broke all the rules and led a terrible gang. He is also uh, uh, someone who, uh, well, got special power and managed in a certain way to keep order on the island of Chios. It was an order that left a lot of room for runaway slave gangs, but uh, no, he's, uh, he's sort of in between. And Drimachus' story, like some of the others, offers us the allure of vicarious transgression. The interplay of order and transgression, I believe, is a powerful part of the kick in Greek tragedy, which is where a lot of hero tales ended up. Tragedy involves people committing some of the most terrible crimes imaginable. People kill their fathers, marry their mothers, kill their mothers because their mothers kill their husbands, because their husband kills their daughters, all this and more. It's terrible stuff. Plato thought it would undermine public morals and people should not be allowed to watch it. But the stuff of myth and tragedy, sex, violence, and family conflict is a part of human nature. How do we process these forces, which are, again, I think very basic to our nature and also uh, have, uh, oh, they're, they're, have a lot of really messy outlets which you'd really better avoid. Uh, how do we process all of that? Well, I think uh, we need a mean between acting out and repression. Tragedy, I think, and hero tales and cult for that matter, are a very effective mean. Characters in tragedy act these things out for the audience, so tragedy lets our inner monsters out of the cage, then they can run around and play for a bit. It also kills off most of the people who do the acting out. More important, tragic performances where all these things are acted out took place at public festivals, that is, on occasional holidays, when ordinary work stops and the normal demands of real life are relaxed. Heroes are not, then, are not role models, they are characters in collective fantasies, and fantasy life resists sharp distinctions between right and wrong. Heroes do and endure on a large scale what we do on a small one. Their wrongs and sufferings, their crimes and enormities are ours writ large. Perhaps hero cult, like hero myths and tales, is also a way of dealing forces in our psyches. Uh, now, I don't really want to talk about the inner psychic lives of people who have been long dead, but I'm going to venture a few guesses anyway. That's one of the nice things about being in classics, by the way. Uh, you often don't have very firm evidence of something, so you can uh, guess away. <laughs> so hero cult is a community's way of dealing with strong disruptive forces, and it expresses a wide range of reactions to things about which our thoughts and feelings are inherently complex and ambivalent. These forces are honored, respected, and dreaded. They are objects of some of our strongest fantasies, and some of our greatest anxieties. Perhaps in worshiping these outsized, grotesque p heroes, people are also expressing their varied and mysterious reactions to things we all have inside us. So, thank you, and we have a little time for questions or comments. <laughs> thank you. Yes, any thoughts? Especially now that I've tried to make this stuff so Hollywood. Uh, yes, sir. It seems like uh, being an orphan would have been a good job. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, you, yeah besides, besides getting all of this action in stories, uh, real-life oracles actually don't do a whole lot of that, unfortunately. But uh, aside from getting all of the actions, yeah, you're a god. People come and make big offerings to you. And uh, if they make especially big offerings, you might give them especially nice oracles. So it's a good racket. <laughs> yes. Anything else? Well, thank you all very much, and uh, <laughs> we can take a break for lunch.